recording and um yeah uh, thanks everyone for uh coming it's my pleasure to introduce uh, uh felix simon uh, felix is a journalist communication researcher and doctoral student at the oxford internet institute a knife uh, and news innovation fellow at columbia university's tau center for digital journalism and an affiliate at the center of information technology and public life at the university of north carolina at chapel hill he also works as a research assistant at the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism and regularly writes and comments on technology, media, and politics for various international outlets. Um, Felix will talk to us today about taking ourselves seriously as a field and will give six suggestions for moving mis- and disinformation study forward. And um, thank you so much, Felix, for uh, coming today. Thanks so much for having me. Hello, all. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present my work today. Um, Elmer has already done a brilliant job of introducing me. Um, I have nothing to add to this. I mean, on the right basis, you can see all the um, institutions you just listed. Um, if you want to learn more about me, there will be little QR codes in the slides, which lead you to my website. That's also where you can get in touch. Um, usually, I work on the use of artificial intelligence in the news industry. Um, and one of my side interests, however, is mis- and disinformation, and especially the more critical approaches to the field. And this is what I'm going to talk to you um, about today. And in, in many ways, this is sort of PhD procrastination. I should be working on the other thing, but this is something I find quite interesting. So um, I like to do that from time to time on the side. Anyway, let's get cracking. Um, tell me if you can't see the slides, if there's any issues. Yeah, but hopefully, it hopefully it should work. Great. Okay, and you can see the right one. Anyway, um, so my talk today is largely based on work I did together with Chico Camargo at the University of Exeter, as well as Scott Bren, who used to be at Oxford and is now in the States at um, UNC, and Rasmus Nielsen at the Reuters Institute. And it basically draws a lot from the three articles you can see here. And all these articles, they sort of tackle different topics, but at least to me, there is a common thread running through all of them. And that's basically critique of how things are done in this field of mis- and disinformation studies. And for example, in the work on the right on visuals and COVID-19 misinformation, which we did a couple of years ago, um, the most important finding for me was not in any way related to COVID misinformation itself, but that we rarely look at visual or multimodal mis- and disinformation, although this seems to be slowly changing. I mean, think we've seen a lot of papers sort of coming out recently, which take that seriously. But that was basically sort of one thing um, that sort of connects this paper to the others for me is sort of a critical look at what we as a field do. And in many ways, the other two pieces have tried to do something similar, um, what one might sort of call flippantly pissing into the boat. Um, I personally like to call it critique. Uh, so um, Chico and I looked at this, this term, the infodemic, if it's actually a useful term for us as sort of a research community. And finally, last year, we sort of um, pulled together a lot of our thinking on this topic and what we are doing as a field of sort of mis- and disinformation studies and where we have probably erred in some ways and should um, try to make uh, improvements. And that's the article on the, on the sort of far left um, in the Harvard, um, Harvard Kennedy Misinformation Review. And this talk is sort of largely building on this work of, of Cheek and myself. Now, uh, next slide, okay. Um, Let's start with a sort of a somewhat contentious argument. In my view, mis- and disinformation studies is now too big and too important to fail. Um, and let me briefly unpack what I mean here and why I think this is. Firstly, I think it is firmly entrenched in various academic disciplines with work coming from areas such as sociology, communication, psychology, computer science. Um, and this is not going to go away. It's basically, it's rooted um, in other disciplines and it's not going to disappear anytime soon. This has also meant that a growing number of academics and experts have staked their careers on this endeavor, they right? sort of deeply invested in it. On top of that, a broad range of funding bodies, governments have devoted significant financial resources to the study of mis- and disinformation. And in many ways, the money sort of keeps pouring in. I mean, it's, it's still going, it's probably not as um, sort of free flowing as used to be sort of in 2016 um, after Brexit and the US presidential election, but it's still sort of um, sort of very well funded and probably will continue to be. 
And finally, journalists and policymakers continue to display a keen interest in the topic, um, and this is also true for the public to some extent. It's, it's clearly a salient topic that sort of um, gets people excited, it's something they talk about, etc. So in many ways, one could say we have dynamics at play that have led to a certain momentum, and momentum that I would posit cannot be undone, nor should it necessarily. And that much to, um, is, a, is clear, at least to me, the renewed efforts in recent years to understand how our information environment works, how we act within it, uh, and how both can and should be improved is broadly a good thing. So basically, that's, that's the reason why, in, in many ways, um, misinformation and disinformation studies is, is big and too big and shouldn't fail because it has these positive um, externalities and benefits. But the problem with all this um, trouble has been brewing in paradise. And for a couple of years now, the field has been in the crosshairs. Critics have taken issue with its normative underpinnings and agenda, its methodological rigor, its quality of output. Others have broadly accused it of lacking clear definitions, having a simplified understanding of what it studies, a too great emphasis on media effects, a neglect of intersectional factors, an outsized influence on funding bodies and policymakers. Um, and sort of vice versa, with them having an outsized impact on the research agenda of our field. And all this, I think, presents a challenge, and I do not think we can simply ignore it. Um, some of these criticisms might be in bad faith, out of spite, or politically motivated, but I still I think that we cannot simply wave them away and sort of um, pretend that they do not, do not exist out there. The question is then, what to do with this state of affairs? How should we address the real shortcomings of the field to ensure its positive long-term impact? And I personally deem a complete overhaul of mis- and disinformation studies unlikely, but it's also not necessarily needed. Um, instead, I believe that we can actually do a couple of things as researchers ourselves who work in this field um, in sort of facing the criticism head on and moving forward in developing mis- and disinformation studies as a rigorous and robust field of research to the benefit of um, societies. And the way to do this, I suggest, is by critically interrogating what we do in six areas. And the first of these is what sort of revolves around our audience and agenda. I think we should ask who are myths and disinformation studies for, and whose agenda does this field serve? And I think it's far too easy to produce research thinking that it somehow will never make a difference or have any material impact on the world we inhabit. I do not think that this argument necessarily holds for some of the things coming out of mis- and disinformation studies. And in many ways, the heightened, heightened attention around our field places it and places us in a unique position. Um, and this is nowhere more apparent than in the realm of policymaking. Whatever counts as mis- and disinformation will likely be regulated as such. And we've seen these attempts in the US, we've seen it in the UK, we see it on a European level and in other countries. And in many ways, this extra pressure means that it is important for us as scholars to be careful. We should not just consider if our work is useful from a purely scientific point of view. We also need to think about for whom else it is useful beyond the realm of academic inquiry and for what purposes. And it might be nice and well to proclaim, for instance, an infodemic based on some curse, cursory evidence, but it's quite another thing once this gets used by governments as an excuse, for instance, to infringe upon freedom of speech under the guise of the science. Um, and in many ways, we've seen that during the pandemic, where um, the infodemic was used as a cover by various governments um, around the globe. And we have research actually showing that sort of as a pretense um, to then enact certain policies. It doesn't say that the policies probably, I mean, they probably would have been enacted anyways, but um, under the mantle of the science, um, it sort of was made somewhat easier. And politicians could refer to that and say, well, actually, here's science, here's mis- and disinformation studies saying, but this is a thing we have to do something. And again, this is all of this is not to say that we should stop studying what we study, but rather we should keep the multitude of end users, quote unquote, in mind um, while we do this work and how our work might be used, um, probably and always according um, with our intentions. Connected to this first point is the second area. I think we need to critically interrogate our impact again. And again, some of, the, some of the impact broadly of the field has been positive. I think the increased attention uh, has spurred development around fact-checking, platform regulation, and generally sort of greater awareness of the topic. Um, and in my book, these are all positive outcomes. 
But some of the work being done in mis and disinformation studies has also had negative consequences. And often it seems to have been this work which made the biggest claims on the thinnest evidence. And one example in this context are many of the early studies, especially around bots and fake news during the Brexit referendum, the US presidential election in 2016. Um, as far as I can tell, none of this has held up well in hindsight, but to this day, we see arguments bubbling up that it was fake news that won Donald Trump, for instance, the presidency, um, sort of at the expense of other structural factors, which were in some cases simply swept under the carpet as an explanation for why this has been happening. And I think there's also a risk that some of the work we do and the way we communicate it not only obfuscates the complexity of the matter at hand, but also creates an atmosphere of moral panic. And again, this can have profound consequences. Some recent work indicates that a heightened perception of mis- and disinformation as an issue can reduce trust in news media and credible information more broadly. So it's basically having the opposite effect of, of what we would like to see. But moral panic can also provide cover, again, for political leaders keen on curbing human rights. And again, the pandemic was quite um, sort of um, quite a good example in that in that context. And again, it, it would probably be a stretch to argue that this is entirely the field's fault. Um, there's still, but there still needs to be a reckoning with the impact mis and disinformation studies has, especially in light of um, the varying quality standards of some of the work in this area. Now, which brings me to the third point. I think, in my view sort of a thorough self-assessment is needed. And one that aims to identify the central groups of actors and their incentives, along with the core tenets of the field, while also shining a light on the flows of influence, values, and priorities between philanthropists, funders, academics, policy makers, and the media, sort of all actors who are in some ways active in this space. And I would argue this matters for two reasons. First is something I will pick up on again in a minute, but it broadly relates to the question of diversity. Without diversity, we will have a hard time of making sure that the range of that sort of the range of perspectives are considered in our research. Um, it will also make it more difficult to increase trust in misinformation studies generally if our field does not adequately reflect the communities that it hopes to serve. But the thing is, we can only know what is missing if we critically turn the focus back on ourselves, if, if we actually sort of find out who are we, um, who are the people who do this work, um, and sort of what, what are they doing and why are they doing it. And the second reason is that I think this will likely be the only way that will allow us to understand how genuine academic inquiry is also shaped to some extent by the hunt for things like personal fame, influence, and commercial opportunities, all of which have been and are still present in um, the field of misinformation studies. Um, I, th I think it's not, not unfair to argue that mis and disinfo studies is deeply enmeshed with the spheres of media policy and um, sort of commercial enterprise in some cases. And again, these dynamics are not unique to this field, but I think they ought to be taken seriously as they can have quite a significant impact on what gets studies and why and uh, with what effect. The fourth area concerns our history and normative positions. And here I'd like to sort of give a brief shout out to Chris Anderson, um, who has in the past sharply criticized, um, and he's done that quite well, the lack of historical grounding um, of our field, which in his view often ignores um, its predecessors, such as propaganda studies, which is basically a field founded and flourishing in the US Cold War environment of the 1950s and afterwards. But I think, it's not unfair to sort of um, quote Chris that way, and that, that's sort of at least the view I take. This ignorance comes at a cost um, as the views and conceptions of these fields linger and they continue to shape what we do today. Um, but yet, sort of far from looking critically on whose shoulders we stand, we should also make clear which normative positions we have and where they come from. In other words, whose corner are we fighting and what should a good information environment, uh, which is sort of ultimately what most of us are sort of working towards actually look like from the point of view of our field? Do we want a freer flow of information? Do we want the opposite, something in the middle? Um, do we sort of want to tell people what is right or wrong? Um, do we not want to do this? Not always, I think, is the answer to this clear, but it's something we should consider in the foreground because in many ways, we always have implicit norm normative assumptions as researchers. 
And in many ways, um, that's not a problem, but it's something I think we need to make explicit um, because otherwise we might be guided by them without sort of realizing and they will then sort of end up shaping the work we do. Now, fifth, I submit that mis- and disinformation studies still suffers from a too narrow scope. And what I mean here is that information and communication are inherently contextual and situated within deep-rooted national, political, social, cultural, um, racial, and ethnic contexts. And I think our field should reflect on this and take it into account. And all too often, we fail to do this, and I'm certainly guilty of this myself in my work. Um, I'm no exception here. And again, the examples are plenty. I think too many of our studies still look at the usual suspects, such as the United States and countries in the global north, the role of race and ethnicity, gender and class often do not play a role, or if so, only a minor one, it's sort of treated as an afterthought rather than sort of as the focus of um, a lot of our work. And similarly, we focus often too much on a set of platforms and digital media in general in what we study and how we study these things, even though we actually know that mis- and disinformation works beyond these categories and technologies. I mean, television, for instance, uh, is quite important, but if you look at the distribution of um, sort of studies looking at, say, Twitter versus um, like traditional television, um, that's sort of a strong imbalance. And again, there has been progress in this regard, um, but I, I still think that the current efforts we sort of do or make do not go far enough and we should broaden our scope not only to achieve equity but also to produce ultimately stronger research because if we just look at certain segments it's never going to get us closer to the better um, and broader answers now finally number six um that's the point of rigor and again while rigor can take and should take many different forms um i see commitment to methods agnostic approaches as one of the most pressing issues here the question and the topic under investigation should drive the selection of methods, not vice versa. And in many ways, the reason I put this here is sort of I'm, I'm not the best person to ask actually about a methodological rigor because I'm, I'm sort of mostly see myself um, as a sort of theoretical scholar in, in a lot of what I do. So please don't quiz me on um, quantitative rigor. But I think in many ways, what I, what I see often is that we um, have a certain approach, say like computation, social science. And then we try to sort of use that everywhere, um, often or not, not so seldomly ignoring that in some cases, actually a different approach might work better. And there are these, these sort of, um, well, prejudices against some methods, even though they might work quite well and produce very rigorous result, results in some contexts. And ideally, um, again, I think we would become, as a field, more methods agnostic and see what works for a given question for a given phenomena we we try to study rather than sort of coming in with the methods and saying oh here's what i can do now i want to study these things how do how do i sort of make the two things fit together second point here is in many ways that the field is composed of actors with sometimes quite widely differing viewpoints in many ways that's normal but it's also very apparent in mis- and disinformation studies and it's well encapsulated, for example, by the debates we have around the effects of mis- and disinformation, where some people um, sort of fall in the camp of saying it has big effects and it's therefore uh, something really to worry about. Other people are sort of on the opposite end of the spectrum. Um, and that's, it's not necessarily problematic. I mean, it's, it's good to have disagreement and hopefully over time we'll find out co correct answers. But if we sort of think again, back to the impact and um, the impact mis- and disinformation studies is having beyond academia, that's something that confuses people. Um, and it's, it makes it difficult, more difficult for other actors, policymakers, the media, and ultimately the public to understand what is going on. And I think one way to, to try to resolve these differences could actually be things like adversarial collaborations, both in empirical and theoretical work. And these good faith collaborations between agnostic or antagonistic camps um, might actually lead to better outcomes than the current gridlock, which is often marked by ad hominem attacks online, um, which are fun to read, but they don't really get us anywhere. So hopefully this is something we as a field sort of will embrace, where people from different camps actually get together and say, well, we're both interested in that question. How can we make sure that we come up with studies or um, work that addresses this, which sort of satisfies both ends as much as possible. Finally, 
sorry, my computer being slow there. I think that the future of mis and disinformation studies does not have to look like the present. And again, I do not want to suggest here that the present state of the field is, it is dismal, it isn't. But I think to simply dismiss some of the critiques are lobbied against it out of hand would not be responsible either. And mis and disinformation studies arguably has made important and much needed contributions. They have allowed us to gain a deeper understanding of our information environments and our role within them. And they have led to positive change um, in sort of tackling this and, and ultimately sort of ensuring that we all as citizens are better informed. And again, as such, I think the field is too big to fail and actually cannot be allowed to. But we can only make this happen if we honestly engage with our shortcomings. And hopefully some of the suggestions I've made here will be helpful in this endeavor, although I'm much more curious actually to hear what I am missing in this talk and what else could or should be done or where the things I have said are, are sort of misleading or wrong. Um, so in many ways, I'm much more excited about the discussion to follow than um, this sort of brief summary of the work um, I've done with Chico. And again, undoubtedly, I think the main problem with building more solid foundations from the inside is that any such undertaking always requires sometimes uncomfortable choices by the involved actors, choices which often go against very strong incentives to keep things the same because that's easier. And what we should not forget in this context is also that there is a limit to what we can do. All our efforts will amount to nothing if, for example, news reporting on the subject continues to favor style over substance and nuance. But that's not something we can necessarily change for now. We can sort of lobby for that. We can um, accuse the media of, of um, sort of compressing uh, complexity into, into a couple of short lines, and we can ask them to do better. But the, the best thing we can do as a field to make a change is to start with ourselves before we sort of look outside. So I think there's hope, and it's on us to keep on trying. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. And now let's let's discuss this together. And I'm curious to hear what you think. <laughs>